Welcome to Smart Catalyst number 19, 2018. So today we are going to see all these articles. The first one is Consensus eludes APEC meet amid the US-China trade tensions. The second one is about the project Rhino. The third one is India steps up agro diplomacy with China. The fourth one is Cyclone Gaja, which is being prepared against extreme events. And the fifth one is further stressed by thermal power plants. And the sixth article is balance of power between government and RBI. And the last article is Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction. The first article is consensus eludes APEC meet amid the US-China trade tensions. So what the news here is, yesterday the APEC meet was concluded. So APEC means Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. So these are the APEC countries, okay? So yesterday this meet was concluded, but because of the US-China trade tensions, the meeting was not going as expected and there was no consensus among the APEC members, okay? So you can easily remember the names of these APEC countries by means of tracing the rim of Pacific Ocean, okay? So see, Canada, US, Mexico, Peru, Australia. So in this context, now we are going to see what this APEC means. So APEC is Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. So it is a regional economic forum which was established in the year 1989 and it contains 21 members which primarily aim to increase the prosperity of the people of that Asia Pacific region by means of promoting balanced, inclusive, sustainable and innovative growth by means of accelerating the regional economic integration among the people. So the main aim of APEC is to enhance the regional economic integration among the member countries. So for that purpose, it ensures that the goods, services, investment and the people of those countries can easily move across the borders. So apart from that, it also recognizes the impacts of the recent climate change and for that, it implements a lot of initiatives, thereby it increases the energy efficiency and promotes sustainable management of forest and marine resources in, the, in those member countries. Its headquarters is in Singapore. And if you see here, India is just an observer of this APEC and it is not a member. So the next article is Project Rhino Vision 2020. So this article talks about the decline of the one horn rhinos population. So it is mainly due to the poaching. So because of this poaching activities, as well as the fragmentation of the habitats of these one horn rhinoceros, their population are now declining at a very higher level. So in order to tackle that, the Assam government implemented a vision which is Indian Rhino Vision 2020. So even though it is a sub-level program or it is a state-level program, it will be supported by World Wildlife Fund and the International Rhino Foundation as well as a number of local NGOs. Okay. So this project Rhino was launched in the year 2005 and its main aim is to make the Rhino population to at least 3000 which is spread over 7 protected areas in the state of Assam by means of translocating them. So that means instead of keeping the rhinoceros only in these two places you have to translocate them to several other places like Manas, Dibru Saikova as well as Lakova, Bura, Chapuri wildlife sanctuaries. So by means of translocating them from here to several other wildlife sanctuaries, we can protect it from natural disasters like flooding in Brahmaputra, etc. Because we know that Assam is more prone to this Brahmaputra flooding. So by means of this, we can protect them. So see in this picture, we are having this Kasiranga National Park here and Pabitora wildlife sanctuary near Gauhati. So now they are planning to translocate from these two places to several other places like Manas, Dibru Saikova, Lakova Wildlife Sanctuary, Orang National Park, etc. Okay. So this is Brahmaputra River. And this one horned rhinoceros is native to Indian subcontinent and its IUCN status is vulnerable. And its main habitat is alluvial grassland and riverine forest. And as of 2008, we have 2,500 mature individuals of one horned rhinoceros to live in wild and it is mainly concentrated, that is this one horned rhinoceros is mainly concentrated in India, Nepal and before it was in Pakistan but now it is no more, it is extinct in Pakistan. So the next article is India steps up agro diplomacy with China. So what this article talks about is over the past two months, Indian food and beverage producers have been conducting a lot of seminars and shows in the Chinese capital. So why? Because we all knew about the trade war which is happening between US and China. 
So US and China are putting a lot of tariffs against the imports of the goods or services over the other countries' products continuously. So because of that, there is a vacuum created in the Chinese market. So in the view of that, now India is trying to occupy that position or India wants to make use of that opportunity, especially by means of agro diplomacy. Okay. So by under this agro diplomacy, they mainly aim to capture the market of China, especially in these four products. One is the Indian soya bean exports. The second one is Assam tea. The third one is sugar and fourth one is non basmati rice. So we are trying to increase our exports in these four products to China where US is dominating before okay but there is a slight concern over here that is India has a very good market in terms of pharmaceuticals information technology and tourism but it is not that much potential in terms of China that means though we capture all these sectors in other countries we couldn't be able to make it with China so we are having a lot of trade deficit with China, nearly $63 billion trade deficit with China. So in order to tackle that, in order to reduce that trade deficit with China, especially by means of more agri exports to China. Okay. So if you see in this picture, it is year wise trade deficit between India and China. So if you see here with the rest of the world, we are having only 65% trade deficit, but with China alone, we are having like nearly 53% trade deficit. So it indicates that the trade deficit of India with all other countries have fallen by 28 percentage but with China it has risen by 13 times in the last 10 years alone and if you see in terms of imports and exports also our imports are more when compared to our exports with China so we have to tackle them by means of more agri export by means of this agro diplomacy with China so the next article is cyclone Gaja which is being prepared against extreme events so what this article talks about is so what this article talks about is the cyclone gaja which is a major or severe cyclonic storm it actually hit tamil nadu to a severe extent but though the tamil nadu government was more prepared than before for these kind of extreme events but it still took a toll of at least 45 lives and it damaged the infrastructure property and agriculture to a certain extent so 2018 is the most active cyclone season in the north indian ocean since 1992 so now we are going to see certain steps which were taken by the state government in order to mitigate the post as well as the pre cyclonic period so the first major effort is through a dedicated national and state organization which was initiated like more than 15 years ago and that only helped during this event so that is what mentioned by the author and the second one is the bureaucracies are also now started working with very higher efficiency by means of providing early warning systems thereby they mitigate the impact of the cyclones by means of saving a lot of people's life by issuing a stream of alerts so they are alerting the people ahead of the cyclones which helped those uh, coastal residents to move to camps as well as adopt some safety measures. So by means of this early warning technology as well as these kind of alert system, the state government actually have done a lot of saving of life by means of doing these before active measures even before the cyclone occurs. Here the Ministry of Home Affairs has also started this national cyclone risk mitigation program thereby they reduce the impact of these kind of catastrophic events especially on the states like Andhra Pradesh, Odisha, West Bengal, Tamil Nadu and Gujarat. So these states are classified as states with higher vulnerability to these extreme events okay higher vulnerability states these are. So not only these kind of risk mitigation program but also the state government has taken a lot of post disaster management measures such as clearing the roads, remove the fallen trees and repair the power infrastructure as well as the communication system, thereby helping the people to restore to some kind of stability in that disaster affected region. Now we are going to see some facts about the cyclonic events in our country. So India is exposed to nearly 10% of world's tropical cyclones, which is according to National Cyclone Risk Mitigation Project. And the second one is one third of our country's population are at risk of these kind of cyclones and approximately 76 percent of the total loss of the human lives from the cyclonic storms have occurred only in india and in bangladesh it is reported by ipcc 
so and also the eastern coast of india is more prone to cyclones than the western coast and nearly 308 cyclones hit the eastern coast till now but only 48 affected the western coast so and also if you see most of the indian coastal regions are located in the tropical region and the tropical cyclones need a temperature of around 25 to 27 degrees celsius so greater the temperature over the sea more the power of the cyclone is and that is what triggering these kind of tropical cyclone especially in this coastal regions of our country so what is the way forward here is all the states especially the coastal states should focus on reducing the hazard through these kind of extreme events by means of implementing the policies which expand the resilient housing which build more better storm shelters as well as creating the financial mechanism for insurance and compensation for the people who lost their properties as well as their lives during this events. So the next article is Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. So this article talks about the Sendai Framework which is primarily focuses on reducing the disaster risk and it is a framework which is a 15 year non-binding voluntary agreement between the countries and the responsibility for this kind of disaster reduction policies are shared between the all the member countries as well as including the local government the private sector as well as the other stakeholders this sendai framework was adopted during the third un conference on disaster risk reduction which was held in sendai in japan in 2015 so this united nations international strategy for disaster reduction unisdr it is the implementing agency for the proper implementation follow up and support of this sendai framework and before Sendai framework, we, we were having like Hyogo framework, which of the period of 2005 to 15. And after that, as a follow up, this Sendai framework was implemented. So under this Sendai framework, we are having seven global targets and four specific priorities. So what are the seven global targets of this Sendai framework means the mortality, that is the number of deaths which occur due to the extreme events and the number of affected people due to that events and the economic loss for the country and the critical infrastructure and disruption of basic services damage. So all these things should be mitigated to a level which is very much lesser than the 2005-15 level. So this is the reduction target and at the same time, the countries with national and local disaster risk reduction strategies and the international cooperation among those countries and the availability and access of early warning systems, technologies and information etc. should be increased to a level which is very higher than the 2015 level. So these are the global targets of this Shendai framework. So under this Shendai framework, they are having four specific priorities in order to achieve these seven goals. One is first we have to understand the disaster risk. And second, you have to strengthen the governance of disaster risk. And third one is you have to invest more in disaster risk reduction after for resilience. And the last priority is to improve the disaster preparedness to ensure more effective response, recovery, reconstruction and rehabilitation, even if, if at all such extreme events occurred. Global platform for disaster risk reduction. So what is this global platform for disaster risk reduction means? It is a biennial forum, which means two year once forum. Okay. Its major aim is to reduce the disaster risk. Like Shendai framework, it is also aiming to reduce the risks of disasters by means of enabling the governments, NGOs, scientists, practitioners, as well as the UN organizations, whoever the part of the Hyogo framework, as well as the Shendai framework, they are the members of this global platform thereby they can share their experience and formulate the strategies to implement the disaster risk reduction to a greater extent so one such 2017 global platform was held in canton at mexico so the next article is further stressed by thermal power so this article talks about how the power sector is consuming more water resources thereby the competition between the power sector and the other sectors are kept in, kept on increasing. So what the news here is the composite water management index which is the CWMI which is released by the Niti Aayog and in that they stated like nearly 600 million people are facing high to extreme water stress in India as of now. So in the pursuit of cooperation as well as the competitive federalism, the Niti Aayog always laying emphasis on developing certain indicators on various sectors. Okay. As a further step, 
in direction and keeping the view of the criticality of water for life the niti aayog has prepared a report on this cwmi which is an important tool to assess and improve the performance of the states as well as the union territories in effective management of water resources which is available in our country so if you see in terms of cwmi what is this cwmi means it is an index which comprising of nine broad sectors with 25 different indicators covering various aspects of groundwater restoration of water bodies irrigation farm practices drinking water policy and governance based on these nine parameters they are actually concluding or deriving this cwmi index so this cwmi is expected to establish a public national platform thereby they can provide the information on the key water indicators across each and every state thereby we can monitor the performance and we can increase more transparency and encourage the competition among the states and also these kind of data can be used by the researchers and entrepreneurs and the policy makers to enable broader ecosystem innovation for the water in our country and as per this cwmi report india is at a dismal of 120th rank among the 122 countries in the water quality index it is very worst right and also the demand supply of the fresh water by the end of 2030 would be like 1498 whereas the supply is only 744 but this if this level is going to persist it will eventually lead to a 6% loss in the country's gdp by 2030 and the sector wise requirement like the drinking requirement domestic requirement industrial requirement as well as this kind of energy requirements these requirement are also going to rise steeply between the year 2030 to 2050 we all knew that the india's ambitious development plan especially in terms of energy sector it is also pushing or it is also putting more pressure on the water resources which is available in our country and especially this energy sector means the share of the water resources consumed by the energy sector in the year 2010 is like it was like 0.62% but they expected the share of water resources by the energy sector to be raised by 1.37% in 2030 and 8.9% in 2050 so it is a major concern and we have to address this for that only this cwmi is acting as an indicator for each and every state government thereby they can take sufficient steps in order to reduce the dependency of the water resources so now we are going to see the dependency of water resources by the power sector so nearly 86% of india's total power generation is mainly from the thermal electricity and among that 86 percentage 77 percentage of electricity comes from the power plants which purely dependent on the fresh water resources and in that 77 percentage nearly 38 percentage of generation capacity are installed in areas which are high or extremely high water stressed areas so it is a very major concern right and the second major thing is by 2030 more than 70% of power sectors are going to experience a competition from agriculture urban as well as other industrial demands for the fresh water resources and the cwma mentioned three main issues regarding the collection of data about the consumption of water by these power sectors so the first major uh, challenge is limited coverage that means measuring the water consumption by the power plants has been a challenge for long years so we can't be able to collect the data perfectly about the consumption of water by the power plants so that is the first thing and the second one is even though we collect the data it is unreliable and third one is the limited coordination and the sharing of the data among the power sectors as well as the other sectors to the government so these are all the major issues while collecting the information about the water resources consumption so what is the way forward here is it should be tackled by means of utilizing an existing policy itself that is the cea which is the central electricity authority reporting mechanism for daily generation so the amount of water consumed by the power sectors should be reported on a daily basis this is the first proposal so you have to daily report the amount of water that is utilized by the power plants so that is what mentioned in this place that is daily water withdrawal and the consumption reporting should be mandated and this can be measured by means of utilizing the existing technology and added into the cea reporting framework 
So by means of this updation, you can easily track the amount of utilization of water, the over usage of the waters, as well as we can make the states better prepared to manage their water as well as the power resources in the phase of looming water shortages. So see in this picture, 40% of India's thermal power plants are in water scarce areas. So the last article is balance of power in the balance. So this article talks about the power struggle which is going on between the central government and the central bank. So what the news here is the central government is actually aiming or eyeing on the excess surplus of RBI to be transferred to the government's account thereby it can meet its fiscal deficit. So in this context this article talks about whether who has more power, the RBI has more power or the government has more power. That is, now the government is trying to control the RBI governor through the board of directors. So if you see in this board of directors, it is like has 10 members who are nominated by the central government. So now the government is trying to control him through this board of directors. but the power of these board of directors to control the RBI governor is very limited because it is not like a corporate setup where the managing director is one of the member of the board of directors and he is only from the board of directors and he derives his power from the board of directors but it is not like the corporate setup. The RBI governor draws his power from RBI act and not from the board of directors as like that. So it is wrong to compare a corporate board to the RBI. This is what stated by the author in this article. And also they stated like the governor, the RBI governor is not subservient to the board of directors because he draws direct power from the RBI act and not from these board of directors. So now we are going to see the composition of RBI board. So it has governor that is RBI governor and four deputy governors and four directors, one from each regional boards of the RBI and 10 directors who are nominated by the central government and one more government official who is also been nominated by the central government. And now we are going to see certain important sections under the RBA Act 1934. So the first one is section 7. Under section 7, the power of the board of directors as well as the power of the governor should be concurrent. That means they should work in tandem. And so under section 7, 1, it actually empowers the central government to issue directions to the RBI from time to time basis if it deals with the matters of public interest but only after the consultation with the RBI governor and section 7.3 gives the governor's power that means it is the source of governor's power governor draws power only from this section so the last section is section 58 which empowers the board of directors to override the governor's power but only under two circumstances one is those actions by the board of directors should be within the provisions of the RBI act and the board should also seek approval from the central government before imposing those kind of actions and those approval should be within 30 days. So what is the way forward here means even before there were a lot of disagreements between the RBI and the central government but they were shorted out in private and in any of those scenarios neither the section 71 or nor the section 73 have been unleashed because of the spirit of accommodation as well as the importance of the mutual respect towards each other and the understanding between each other. But now the center is eyeing on the RBI or trying to control over the RBI is actually affecting the health of our Indian economy as a whole because there should be a clear separation of power between the RBI and the government in terms of money. That means why because RBI is the money creator and the government is the money spender. So there should be a clear separation between those two things and there should be no among those two entities. So now the author is concluding by saying that the RBI and the center should behave like the mature entities and they should uphold the time tested conventions and act with mutual respect and the spirit of accommodation among those two.